Hey now, folks, today we are taking a look at Super Dungeon Explore from Cool Mini or Not and Soda Pop Miniatures. I think Soda Pop Miniatures is the main uh, publisher of it, and Cool Mini or Not helped them with the manufacture of the miniatures for it. Now, this is a dungeon crawling game, but unlike games like Descent or uh, Mice and Mystics, where it's you know more of telling a story and going through a campaign, like a sort of an RPG light type this is purely hack and slash. This is like if you took the actual combat dungeon experience of a role-playing game, stripped out all the storyline, all the different questing, and going to the store and shopping and things like that, and just had the hack and slash, which definitely is going to appeal to a certain subset of people, uh, especially people who maybe like uh, online MMO type uh, player versus player games, things like that. And speaking of that, this isn't just a dungeon crawl. This is supposed to be an homage to video games. It actually has sort of the trifecta of three different genres, which is anime, and is in so much as all the characters from the game are these little chibi characters, and even the monsters look like chibi monsters for the most part. Um, together with the RPG dungeon crawl style, but then having that, the, the real main inspiration are video game RPGs and adventure games. Um, even going so far as in some of the expansions, like one of the expansions you have turtles who can actually kick each other and throw shells at the players. Um, one of the heroes looks like Link, one of the heroes from the expansion looks like Princess Peach. In uh, the normal base game, the, the name of the overlord for the game, one player controls the overlord and the rest of the players control the heroes going through this dungeon, but the Overlord's actual name in uh, Super Dungeon Explorer is the console, C-O-N-S-U-L, get it. Uh, and there's a lot of extra stuff like that. Like there's, when you start off the game, you're in 8-bit mode, then as the game progresses, you go to 16-bit 16 16 -bit mode, then super 16-bit mode. So lots and lots of video game references here. And like I said, one player is the console, the others are the heroes trying to go through the dungeon, take out the spawn points for the monsters, which is in itself a, an homage to the old game Gauntlet, if you remember that. Uh, take out these spawn points that are constantly spawning monsters, trying to lure out the big boss, um, but having to go through his mini bosses first, lure out the big boss, whatever that boss may be. In the base game, it's a dragon. Take out the dragon, win the game. If you're the overlord, the console, you're trying to wipe out the heroes. So the concept is very simple. There's a lot of stuff in the game though, so let's go through the overview, then we'll come back and I'll give you my final opinion of it. All right, I'm not gonna go over every single rule in Super Dungeon Explorer because there's a lot of little rules to the game, but I am gonna give you a broad general overview to see if it's something you might enjoy. This is a competitive game for at least two players. One player is always gonna be the console who is sort of the overlord who takes control of all the different enemies and that would be all these little red figurines that are out on the board and all the different spawn points. Uh, at least one other player is going to take control of the heroes. Now, you can have up to five heroes of the game and that really doesn't change depending on the number of players. You could have one player taking control of all five heroes, or have five players taking control of each of a hero, or have less than five heroes. But really what it does change is that the more heroes you have, the more difficult the game is, or the more stuff is in the game, I should say. So for every hero that you have, you're gonna put a different dungeon tile out, and all these dungeon tiles are double-sided. You have crystal caverns, or the lava fields, and you do have different cards reminding you of what all these different effects are, like being in lava sucks because you catch on fire and you get hurt. Uh, the Crystal Caverns have difficult terrain that's more difficult to move through, and so on. Now, every tile also gets a treasure chest. Uh, there are treasure cards over here which are really good for the heroes. We'll get back to those in a moment. Uh, and it also determines the number of spawn points that the console has access to. The more spawn points there are, the more likely, or it's for sure, that this console's gonna, the console is going to spawn more and more enemies. So, more heroes equals more trouble. Also, uh, depending on the number of heroes, you'll have one or two mini bosses who in this uh, base game are these ogres here and also if you play with a lot of heroes you're going to have to fight the big boss who in this game is starfire the dragon now i mentioned in my intro but all of these miniatures have to be assembled before you can play the game using glue so some of my miniatures you'll see that I, they're put together okay but there's this glue residue that i never bothered to get off and obviously they're not painted either but just know that if you see a gray miniature it's either a hero or a treasure chest and all the red ones are enemies or spawn points now after you have the initial tile board set up over here then you're going to pick your heroes 
uh, all these little hero miniatures are you know very well crafted and I'm not going to show you every single one but once you choose your hero miniature you'll have a different stat card that will go along with it it will tell you all the different things that you uh, your different stats like your movement the number of action points that you get to spend in a turn and uh, what you can do with those with your special abilities. You also have attack, armor, will, and all these different colored symbols that you might be able to see here are the number of dice you roll when you're trying to accomplish that feat. So you have the Riftling Rogue, and on the back of all these cards you have uh, explanations of your abilities and a little bit of backstory about your character. Uh, you have the Glimmer Dusk Ranger, the Royal Paladin, and all these characters are very different. Some of them have healing abilities, some of them are better as strikers. Uh, the Hexcast Sorceress, obviously ranged magic, who can uh, debuff the enemies. The Claw Tribe Barbarian, lots and lots of strength and power, not a lot of defense. Uh, the Hearthsworn Fighter is a pretty solid Dwarven Warrior. The Ember Mage, lots of attack spells. And the Deep Root Druid, who's very interesting because he's a tough fighter on his own, but he has a special ability to transform into the Angry Bear, like any good Druid should be able to do. And here's the Angry Bear miniature, which is worth showing. You see. Alright, so once you've got your heroes, you'll start them off on one of the boards, and then it's time to adventure. You uh, roll your initiative to see who goes first, which is, in this game, whenever you have to roll dice, whatever dice you get to roll, you're basically trying to get stars. The more stars you get, the better. So rolling initiative at the start of a round to see if the console or the heroes goes first, uh, you're just counting up the amount of stars. Now, uh, this is the same thing for attack and defense. The more stars you get, the more likely you're going to get through an enemy's defense. If you can get more stars and they have defense, you'll deal a wound. If not, the wound, the damage is blocked. You also have a couple other things here. If you have, if you ever roll a heart, you get uh, healing for your character, and you have these little heart tokens that will keep track of the damage that you take. Um, some of them have potions. Let me find one of the potions, like this. Now. Potions, your characters will start with some of them. You have these little potion tokens here. And what they do actually depends on the character. On your card, it'll tell you specifically what a potion will do for your character when you use it. Some of them might do straight up healing. Some of them might give protection. Some of them might get rid of status effects and so on. And the way the game works, you can actually just throw potions at anyone as long as you're with, they're within sight of you. Or maybe not even within sight of you. You basically just use a potion, use it on the character, and it takes its effect. Now, the console is not just going to sit here and let the heroes go run roughshod through his dungeon. Every round, when it's the console's turn, he gets to spawn a certain amount of skulls worth of points from the different spawn points. Now, the enemy cards look very similar to the hero cards. You have your movement, your attack, all of your stats, and then somewhere there's a skull marker right here, which will tell you how many points it takes to spawn that monster. The monster. I believe that the overlord, the console, gets four skulls from every skull point. And as the heroes take damage and the monsters take damage, there's a tracker that moves along this little tracking board over here. Every time that it passes one of the skull marks, the console's going to get one of these skull markers. And these are uh, extra tokens that the console can use just for that round to get more and more spawning from those spawn points upwards and above the four, I think, that he usually gets. So, But the console is limited by the amount of figures that you have, so you don't have an infinite, an infinite amount of supplies of forces. But... Uh, regardless, once all the enemies spawn, the console is actually going to take turns moving all of them as he will and taking action. So like I already showed you, you have the Dragon Hatchlings. That's one of the monsters that specifically comes from this spawn point here. And you also have, this is the card for that Egg Clutch. You have these Mimics, which if you accidentally draw a treasure that has the, uh, the Boo Booty on it, then one of the treasure chests the heroes gets the plunders actually turns into an enemy, which is this little thing here. So that's cool. You have, let's see, Cobalt Warrens, which is the card for the spawn point for the Kobolds. You have the Wormling, who also comes from the Dragon spawn point, or the uh, Egg Clutch spawn point. You have Rex, which is one of the Ogre mini bosses. You have the Knuckleheads, which are one of the Kobolds. The Flinger, who's one of the ranged Kobolds. The Cowger, they all have very, very interesting names. The Dragon Priest, who does a lot of debuffs and uh, attack spells on the heroes. And the Iron Scale, who's like a nasty Knight Kobold. And finally, you of course have Starfire the Dragon. And I'll explain more about how she's going to come out in a moment. And you also have extra stuff because Starfire always does uh, 
upwards and above more extra stuff than the other normal enemies in the game. So I mentioned that as you deal damage and as you take damage in the game, you're going to move this tracker up and give the, uh, the console access to more and more of these skull tokens to use. But a couple other things happen as well. First off, the loot tracker goes up as well. And when you get loot, you uh, whenever it gets to one of those spots that says loot, you get to take one of these loot cards, which are basically just uh, useful things that the heroes can use, like a rune of better defense, armor plus one, uh, a rune of strength, attack plus one. There's a resurrection charm somewhere in here. There's a uh, corpse hand, which is just attack plus one, all kinds of, of really simple things like this. If the heroes move to a spot where there's an actual treasure chest on the board, they get a treasure, which is usually much better than loot, but they also take up spots on your board. So uh, you'll actually take your character card and put it above whatever spot it is like this. So long as you have a spot open, you can equip it. It's like the Pegasus Feather gives you plus one. Um, you have the Rune of Mithril, which gives you plus one. And you see that the color of die changes. A green die is always best. Blue is okay. Red is usually the worst type of die that you want to roll. Um, other types of examples, you have the Petrif these are actually specific to this campaign if you're using Starfire as the boss. You have the Petrified Dragonheart, which is plus two health. You have the Dragon Lance, which uh, gives you an extra st special attack and all kinds of different things that you can use in the treasure deck so long as you have the spots for it. So uh, once you have so you'll keep moving along those tracks, the loot track, you potentially get treasure. But also, as the tracker moves along, if it ever gets up to the super point up here, the tracker actually starts over, and then the console has the capability to spawn the mini bosses. Now, if you're playing a game with more and more heroes, or with less heroes, I should say, then that's where this stops. You may only have to fight one mini boss, or if you're playing with a certain amount of heroes, you might have to fight two mini bosses. But if you're playing with the maximum amount of heroes, then once the tracker goes around again, then the console can spawn the boss or something like that at least and the boss is very very nasty he has or she has really improved stats over all the other creatures but what's more is that if you are not able to destroy the spawn points before the boss comes out she's even more powerful she gets to have extra activations when I mean, she takes more actions she can actually deal more damage to the heroes and do more nasty stuff so Basically, the hero's goal is to take out the spawn points as fast as possible and then finally lure out the boss and destroy the boss. And if you can do it in that order, it's much, much better. If not, well, hopefully you can at least take out the boss even if you weren't able to take out the spawn points. And like I said, that's just a very, very fast overview of the game. There's a lot of little details and rules to it, but generally it's a miniature skirmish game, semi-cooperative, the heroes working together against one player taking control of the console, trying to defeat the console, and the console's trying to wipe out the heroes. That's basically Super Dungeon Explorer. There is a very special place in my heart for Super Dungeon Explorer. It is one of the first very big, massive games that I ever added to my collection. And I hemmed and hawed about whether to add it to my collection or not. I mean, the, it's an expensive game. I think even now the MSRP for it is like a hundred bucks, but of course you can find it cheaper at other places. Um, and it's not an easy game to set up. In the base game, unlike the expansions, everything has to be assembled. Every single miniature has to be put together. Some of the heroes with uh, smaller parts are extremely irritating to put together. The dragon is very difficult to put together. If you are not used to miniatures games, and I definitely was not and am not, it's a chore. It took me a very long time to put all this together. I incrementally worked on it over this, a course of a couple of weeks without sitting down and doing it all at once. Um, and it's gonna require a trip to the store, to your local Michaels or Joann's to get uh, the right type of glue, to get the right type of materials, to scrape off some of the excess plastic. A lot of stuff I was not prepared for not being steeped in that miniatures world. That's a huge hurdle to overcome, and I don't want to understate that. So if you are not interested in putting in work for your board games, if you like, if you don't want to do anything more complicated than punching a bunch of chits out of uh, a token board, this is not going to be the game for you. So that's there is that to say up front. Now, assuming you can get through that, assuming you can construct them all together, and you don't mind the fact that they're not painted, which one day I will paint them, I swear. Uh, there's a very fun game here. Um, this is probably the ultimate example of an Ameritrash game, of just having a bunch of miniatures running around a map just hitting things hard. <laughs> and having one person against all the other players trying their, 
trying his or her best to destroy them. And that's the thing is that I think the very first time you play this, you obviously have whoever is the most experienced with the rules of the game play the console, the overlord, and have that person run that player and then all the other new players just take control of the heroes. The advantage is definitely on the console because it's, especially for people who aren't used to cooperative games or even semi-cooperative games, it is very crucial that the heroes work together. So it's more likely the first time you play that the console is just going to obliterate the heroes. But from then on, the advantage, once people know how to play the game, the advantage shifts to the heroes. And in that case, like when I've played Descent in the past, you know, you are encouraged to try, if you're the Overlord, to take out the heroes, uh, to give them a challenge. But ultimately, because you're going through this campaign, it's nice to have the heroes win eventually, you know. But in Super Dungeon Explorer, there's not really a campaign mode yet. So your goal as the console is to wipe out the heroes. Don't hold back. Destroy them. And that's really, I believe, how you're going to get the best amount of joy out of this game. Um, the game has a couple of problems that I want to get out of the way. First off, it's overlong. It's just too long, especially with more people. Um, I hate to say that, but it just, it drags on keeping track of Especially, it, most of that comes from the console side, because putting out all these different monsters, controlling all of them, um, if the heroes are doing what they're supposed to be doing and taking out those spawn points very quickly, then that can definitely help the game move along uh, faster. But if for whatever reason they don't do that, maybe they can't do that, they've had a string of bad luck, the game is going to drag on as the heroes probably die a slow death, because... That's really the key to them winning, keeping those mon more and more monsters from coming out, but also by the time the big boss comes out, keeping that uh, big boss from uh, having uh, being much, much more powerful and having an extra activation because those spawn points are still out. So, But still, the game is probably too long for what it is. It's supposed to be very fast-paced, and it feels like that for the first few rounds, but then you just get to a point where there's a sort of fatigue that sets in. I guess that's a really bad thing. I still like the game but you need to be prepared for that and that's why i think that this game is going to appeal very strongly to people who have played role-playing games before despite the fact that all the story is stripped out and all the actual role-playing for me personally from other dungeons and dragons games that i've played uh i am used to long drawn out combats i'm used to a combat that lasts for hours and hours and that might even stretch into another role-playing game session depending on what combat it is you know if it's the big epic battle that's going to last three or four hours so those type of players are going to be much more used to the length of time it takes to place to play super dungeon explorer which is going to be at the absolute lowest three hours probably up to five hours that's just the way it is it's something to get accustomed to but it's definitely a knock against the game the game, as far as the fiddliness goes, once you have everything laid out, it's not too bad. Keeping track of life can be kind of a pain. If you have certain way, better ways you can keep track of it, whether it's from uh, dice, spinners, things like that, that's probably going to be better for you. Um, but, you know, it's not too bad. Uh, Component-wise, I already mentioned how annoying it is to make the miniatures. Everything else is kind of cool, though. I, liked, I really like the dice that come with the game. Uh, the boards are all nice, my biggest issue with it, though, is that there's not enough of them, and it's not enough of a variety in the different boards. There, you can flip them over, but the only difference is there's some difficult terrain and some lava. It's not that big a deal. Um, and I should say, even though this is just a review for the base game, this is a consistent problem with the Super Dungeon Explorer range of products because this game has been out for a few years now, and there's still not new dungeon tiles. There's rumors of a big expansion coming out, and I hope that that's the case and that it adds more dungeon tiles because it's a huge problem, even with this game out of the box, ignoring the other expansions. Um, but I still like the game. I still think there's a lot of goodness to be had here. I love the variety of different heroes, and all the heroes do different things, different special abilities. They all have different... Uh, things that they're exceptional at, whether it's healing, whether it's ranged attacks, whether it's being the big brute tank, whether it's buffing the other players. There's a lot of heroes just in this base box ignoring the other expansions that come for it. Um, there's, a, there's just a lot of variety there and I really, really enjoy that. Um, different varieties of creatures. You can choose different spawn points depending on the number of players. If you're playing with a full game, you're gonna have to use them all, but that still adds more variety in different ways to play and how you go about doing things. It's just, very very cool it's you know if it wasn't for those dumb tiles all being the same then i would say that every game is going to be very different um now adding expansions to the game and i'll probably review this at another point makes it even better and adding more stuff that you can do and mixing and matching spawn points but i still think that out of the base game you'll get a lot of mileage out of this 
Uh, so who is this game for? Like I said, this is the quintessential Ameritrash game. If you're used to heavy strategic Euros, no. <laughs> Just no. I'm, so I'm sorry that you're even watching this video. I really apologize. Um, if you like role-playing games and you enjoy the combat aspect of that more than the role-playing aspect, if you really love miniatures, if you really love an intense direct contact, uh, conflict and contact, and if you enjoy one versus all games, all of this is really going to be up your alley. I think that it needs some refinement. The rule book is very, very poorly written right out of the box, and unless you get like a second edition of the game, I think they fixed it, but definitely if you don't, go online and get the frequently asked questions and also the updated revised rule book because it'll clarify a lot of things. But if you can get over the initial hurdles of the assembly and understanding the rule book and uh, you can set aside, set aside a lot of time for this game, I think it's worth it. I think it's an experience. It's an experience game. It tells a story. You have a lot of fun. I think that if the, if the console cannot take it too seriously, uh, about the fact that the heroes usually have the advantage, then it can be a lot of fun watching everyone else at the table work cooperatively as a team, get through the game ideally, um, and just have a blast. So really enjoy Super Dungeon Explorer. Looking forward to them adding more stuff and improving on some of the things that need improvement. Um, it's a great game. One of my highest recommendations. My name is Nick. This has been Board Game Brawl. And I'm reminding you to get out there and game every day and every way. Take care.